All right, good morning. Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. I'm just bringing you a public service announcement from the foundation. So, uh, you know, each we usually try to just highlight a research study, and this one happens to be one that I'm involved with called MINT. So you may uh, come across this, this uh, NIH-sponsored uh, study um, is based on a, a preliminary data that uh, investigated if it's beneficial to give transfusions to our heart attack patients because, you know, as, as we've gone through our training and our practice, you know, we've really dialed back how much we transfuse and we're allowing lower and lower hemoglobins, but there's some evidence to suggest that in patients that have heart attacks, a higher hemoglobin is actually better. So this is a randomized study that randomized uh, our patients to a positive troponin uh, and a hemoglobin of 10 or less than 10 get randomized to uh, two strategies. One is uh, restrictive and one is a little more permissive uh, strategy of transfusing based on the hemoglobin, whether it's, uh, you know, less than uh, uh, 8 or less than 10. Um, so this is, I think this is like 3,500 uh, patient study, probably about 100 sites, and we started about several weeks ago. You may see Rose Peterson's uh, involved in, in that, and we've enrolled a couple patients already, so um, enrollment's going well. So I think this is an important study. We've, we've presented the hospitalists are all on board because they, too, feel it's an important question. So if you have any uh, patients that have anemia, um, as well as had a positive troponin, please let us know because we'd like to talk to the patients about enrolling in this important study. All right, thanks. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All right, so I'm Amit Sharma, one of the third year general cardiology fellows, and uh, I have been assigned the task of going through a couple of interesting cases with you today. So uh, let's, let's get going here. Um, I have no disclosures relevant to what we're gonna talk about today. So I have three objectives to go through, and we'll go through these um, each with some illustrative cases. So the first one uh, to talk a little bit about the clinical, echocardiographic, and hemodynamic features of constrictive pericarditis. The second will be to go over the uh, diagnosis and clinical management of uh, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And then the final one will be uh, talking a little bit about when to order a stress echocardiogram and um, probably a little more pertinently how to risk stratify our patients non-invasively across a, a handful of modalities. So uh, let's start talking a little bit about constrictive pericarditis. So in terms of the etiology of this, it kind of depends where the patient is from. Uh, so here in the United States, in the developed world, a lot of our patients that have this, uh, it's going to be the sequelae of prior uh, thoracic radiation, cardiac surgery, uh, some type of a rheumatologic, uh, inflammatory infectious process, um, end-stage renal disease. Those are some of the common things we would think about. But to keep in mind, the uh, most common cause in the developing world is tuberculosis. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. The hallmark of this uh, particular disease is basically the, the heart is encased in a rigid pericardium that limits uh, diastolic filling of the ventricles, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And this is something that you should consider in the setting of patients that come in with heart failure symptoms, uh, oftentimes right-sided in the setting of a normal ejection fraction. So the first case I'll go through with you uh, is a 52-year-old male who came to the United States from uh, Liberia in April of this year. Uh, he had a past medical history significant for gout, no real other surgical history, no medications. And he came to the hospital on April 29th of this year with a progressive dyspnea, lower extremity edema, uh, volume overload, and significant weight gain. Uh, when he presented, his vitals on admission uh, were notable for a respiratory rate of 22. Uh, he had a heart rate of 110. That was sinus tachycardia, uh, oxygen saturation of 95%. He had a chest x-ray that showed a, a large right-sided pleural effusion and I put some of his pertinent labs in here for you. So uh, his total bilirubin was 0.4, alkaline phosphatase was slightly up, uh, his INR was slightly elevated at 
pro BNP of 605. Uh, sodium and potassium are a little bit low in the setting of them not having been eating and drinking all that well. Uh, troponin values were negative. Um, actually, his quantifuron gold test came back positive. Uh, and the initial uh, acid fast uh, bacilli testing was negative, suggesting that he probably did not have active tuberculosis. Um, and as well as blood cultures, HIV and hepatitis workup were unremarkable. So the, the first thing they decided to do was actually uh, tap his right lung. So he went a therapeutic and diagnostic thoracentesis. Uh, I put the, the pleural fluid LD and uh, protein values up there, but this was basically a transudative uh, effusion. So they ordered an echocardiogram to take a, a better look at what was going on. And uh, so I'll bring you up here to the parasternal long axis in the top left. The big thing you can see here uh, really is a, a pretty good size anterior pericardial effusion directed over the uh, RV here. Um, this is a little bit better look at it. I want you to focus uh, a little bit on the septum here. And a key thing to keep in mind is uh, this is a longer clip. So normal echo clips, they're generally the same one to two beats that repeat over depending on how it's set up. So uh, we'll talk about why this is important, but a key thing to look at is the, the exaggerated motion of the septum here towards the LV there and then kind of back towards the, the more midline position and we'll come back to that. Uh, this is a short axis view. Uh, once again, here's the left ventricle here, uh, RV here, and then you'll see the pericardial fluid there. Keep your eye on the septum here once again as you see it intermittently bowing in towards the LV. This is a, a long clip from the apical floor chamber, so just to orient you, uh, left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle. Uh, we're seeing at least part of this pericardial effusion mostly located over the RV. And once again, I bring your attention to this septal motion. Uh, notice how it is swinging back and forth between the LV and the RV. And the other thing to mention about this is that this isn't in a beat-to-beat -beat fashion. Um, this is more, uh, not, you know, every few beats that you're seeing this. And, and once again, we'll go into that. Uh, so this is looking at uh, annular velocities here. Uh, we have the lateral E prime uh, mitral annular velocity here at 7.7. Um, the medial velocity is at 9.25. So uh, as <clears throat> most of us probably know, this is actually the reverse of the typical pattern we would expect where actually the lateral uh, mitral annular velocity should be higher because the septum is uh, a shared structure and it's somewhat tethered. Uh, so this is the reversal of the typical pattern we would see. Um, at the top left here, this is the, uh, as you can see, the mitral inflow variation. So this is looking at uh, basically beat-to-beat -beat variation here uh, in the mitral inflow. And as you can see, there's kind of this uh, undulating type pattern that is, once again, not in a beat-to-beat -beat, uh, fashion. And then you see a similar thing over here uh, with the tricuspid valve. Uh, once again, a, a non-beat-to-beat -beat variability in the mitral inflow, uh, in the tricuspid inflow, excuse me. And we'll talk about that. So the echocardiogram uh, was interpreted as a normal EF, normal uh, pulmonary artery pressure. The RV was uh, enlarged. We didn't, didn't specifically comment on that. Um, <clears throat> the septal motion and then a pretty significant variation in the uh, mitral uh, E-wave velocity. Um, there, was, there was elevated right atrial pressure. I didn't show you an IVC here, just in the interest of time. So the final impression here was that the, the patient had a possible effusive constrictive pericarditis, and there was this question of early tamponade physiology based on the echo findings. So given those findings, the patient underwent a, a bilateral heart cath and a diagnostic and therapeutic uh, pericardiosynthesis. These are the numbers here from his right heart cath. So as you can see, his right atrial pressure was quite elevated at uh, 28. RV pressure was 50 over 21, uh, mean PA pressure of 34, uh, significantly elevated wedge pressure of about 27 to 28, and his cardiac output was 4.4, cardiac index of 2.2, so kind of on the low, low normal scale with the normal PA uh, pressure. They took out 200 milliliters of uh, dark, bloody fluid, uh, <clears throat> and this is an important thing for, the re for a reason we'll come back to. They redid the numbers after the pericardiosynthesis, and there wasn't really a, a significant change in terms of the numbers. And when they looked at the mean pressures, they said they were pretty uh, equilibrated here at about 28 millimeters of mercury. And I couldn't get these tracings, but they mentioned that there was no evidence of ventricular interdependence on the uh, right and left heart cath, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, so the pericardiosynthesis labs, they, were, they had a lymphocyte predominance, um, high, high protein, very high LDH. Uh, 
Uh, and they looked at it from a microbiologic standpoint and did not find any clues there. But this would be more consistent with an exudative process. So we consulted infectious disease, uh, just given this patient's quantiferon gold test being positive and this uh, effusive constrictive pericarditis uh, type physiology. And the thought was there was a questionable history of this gentleman maybe having had active TB many years ago in Liberia. Um, and they decided to treat him empirically for latent tuberculosis with a, a standard four drug regimen. He had a repeat echocardiogram done towards the end of this uh, admission, and it showed a uh, small pericardial effusion, but uh, significantly reduced compared to the initial size, and he was eventually discharged home. Uh, unfortunately, he came back to the hospital um, on July 6th with uh, worsening dyspnea, so a repeat echocardiogram was performed. And once again, this I promise you is not the exact same images from the first study, but it does look very similar. So once again, you see this pericardial effusion here. Um, we'll come back to this, but the fluid doesn't look quite as black here. It looks like a little bit more of an organized process. Um, <clears throat> and then you kind of see the same thing, so looking very similar to the initial studies. Uh, once again, you'll see the septal motion popping towards the LV, which we'll go into a little bit more. Um, this is a longer clip. It kind of shows a very similar location of the pericardial effusion, although this is much more dense in terms of the material. You can see fibrin strands, um, basically quite a bit of material in the pericardium here. And then once again, this is a long clip. So what you're seeing is this is over multiple beats and respiratory cycles, and you see the septum kind of swinging back and forth in a non-beat to beat fashion. Uh, looking here again at mitral inflow, tricuspid inflow, there was once again significant variation that you can see here. And this was a repeat look at the uh, mitral annular velocities, not as good of a look by, uh, in terms of the quality of the signal here, but once again, the lateral E prime velocity was lower than the medial E prime velocity, and the normal pattern, like we talked about, would be the opposite of that. And this didn't show up as well on the, uh, the initial echo, um, but we were able to get a better tracing here. So what they're doing is taking a look here uh, in the hepatic vein with, with Doppler. And what you're seeing here is this is diastolic uh, expiratory flow reversal uh, within the hepatic vein. And once again, you see you have basically a few beats here without it, a couple of beats with it. So this is not in a beat to beat fashion. And this would be something that would be seen in constrictive pericarditis. So once again, to kind of go over this, uh, recurrence of a large uh, pericardial effusion that's uh, <clears throat> a little more complex than the initial one. All of these findings fit with constrictive pericarditis by echocardiographic criteria. Um, and they, they talked about, really, there's pretty good evidence of uh, intraventricular interdependence, which we also saw in the initial study. So once again, cardiology was consulted. And the thought, there was a lot of kind of discussion had here, but the thought was, given the fact he was being treated for latent TB, there was no evidence of active TB, and despite that, that he'd reaccumulated this complex pericardial effusion, um, the thought was that this probably would, would be challenging to drain uh, uh, from a pericardiosynthesis standpoint, just given the organized nature of the fluid, and given that it had come back despite therapy, he underwent uh, a CV surgery consult for a pericardial window. That was undertaken on July 11th. Um, his pericardial biopsy didn't really show much other than uh, some chronic fibrosis and inflammation. Unfortunately, a few days after the uh, procedure, he went to the uh, ICU because he was uh, having more respiratory issues, ultimately had a bradycardic PEA arrest, um, was resuscitated unsuccessfully, and ended up passing away. And uh, they actually did do an autopsy on this, and the cause of death was actually an uh, extensive PE burden. So that was, that was what he died of. And they also mentioned that the, the pericardium uh, had evidence of fibrinous pericarditis, basically. So not, not a great ending um, to this case, unfortunately. But what I really like about this is, uh, especially after having just taken my echo boards a couple months ago, looking at all these things, I hadn't come across a case that put all these echo findings together in a clinical fashion. So I thought that was, this was a good, uh, good case to go through this. And so when you look at constrictive pericarditis, the, the two things to think about are the enhanced ventricular interdependence, um, as well as dissociation of intracardiac and intrathoracic pressure. So let's go into these. In order to understand this, we have to have an understanding of what normal physiology is in the setting of normal respiration. So normally, as we take a breath in, intrathoracic pressures will drop, and those pressures will equally be transmitted to the uh, intracardiac pressure. So the intracardiac pressures should, should drop. 
And you would see this both in the LV and RV at the same time. So this is something that we call ventricular concordance. Uh, and in expiration, the opposite happens as intrapleural pressure rises. Intracardiac pressures will also rise both in the LV and RV, and they do this together. Um, this is actually a, a snippet I took from a tamponade patient, but this talks a little bit about the, the respiratory variation. So when you think about the normal physiology that we just talked about, is with inspiration, you have a decrease in your intrathoracic and intracardiac pressures. That's both the same on both the LV and the RV and the reverse in expiration. Um, you can see this in tamponade. You can also see this in constriction, but really the dissociation of the intrathoracic and intracardiac pressures happens because as you look at your pulmonary veins, they are actually not encased in pericardium. So when we take a breath in, the decrease in pressures are transmitted to the pulmonary veins. However, because the ventricles are encased, uh, specifically the left ventricle for this part, is encased in a rigid pericardium, that prevents the pressure drop from being transmitted to the ventricles. So what you actually see is a decrease, which is here, um, compared to here in the filling gradient to the left side of the heart with inspiration. And we'll come back to that. Uh, this is a look at uh, hemodynamic tracings. I just wanted to show you this. This is the uh, classic dip and plateau uh, physiology that you would see with the pressure tracing where you have rapid early ventricular filling um, and then it all of a sudden stops when the, the heart has stretched and reached the limit imposed by the pericardium. So this is called the dip and plateau here. And you can also see um, the near equalization of the, the left ventricular here and then uh, right ventricular and diastolic pressures as well. So these are some of the things we, we talked about, but just to go through them. Um, so one of the things you'll see here is this respirophasic movement with, uh, of the septum. And this happens because, once again, as we take a breath in, uh, the right side of the heart will be filled preferentially. The gradient to fill the left side of the heart goes down. So the septum with inspiration will move to the left side. The opposite happens in expiration where the left side of the heart fills at the expense of the right side. And you see the septum moving over to the right ventricle. And once again, that's going to be in a respiratory, not a beat-to-beat -beat fashion. And the other thing you'll see on mitral inflow velocity here is going to be uh, restrictive. Uh, you don't see the variation here quite as well, but what you do see is this restrictive pattern of mitral inflow, and this suggests very rapid early filling of the ventricles with really very minimal contribution from the atrial kit. Um, this is looking at, the once again, the hepatic veins, and what you see is this diastolic uh, reversal here. You have to look at the ECG tracing down here with expiration. And then once again, the reversal with the medial uh, annular velocities being higher than the lateral velocities. And this is just a zoomed in look here uh, with a respirometer here at the bottom, um, looking at as we inspire here, the septum actually comes down into the LV. And then once we expire, you see the opposite motion of it. The other thing you'll commonly see is as a nonspecific septal bounce, septal shutter. That's something that you can see beat to beat, but the swinging of the septum really should be in a respirophasic manner. And um, for the sonographers who were kind enough to show up, this is something that if you are doing routine, just regular clips and you're not doing a long run of this, this is something you, you might miss. So um, you kind of have to be, be aware of, of what you're looking for and, and kind of think ahead with this. So this is a, once again, simultaneous right ventricular and left ventricular tracings. We have constrictive pericarditis at the top, um, restrictive cardiomyopathy at the bottom. And what you'll see is as a result of this um, exaggerated ventricular inter interdependence, inspiration, our LV pressures will fall, but actually the RV pressures go up. And with expiration, you see the, the opposite, where the LV pressures go up and the RV pressures go down. So this is um, basically the opposite of what would be normal and what you, could, what you would see in constrictive, uh, excuse me, restrictive cardiomyopathy, whereas the pressures in the left ventricle and right ventricle would decrease with inspiration and then increase with expiration. Um, this is a, a paper looking at uh, <clears throat> a ratio here of the, the RVN diastolic pressure and the RVN systolic pressure and trying to differentiate uh, constrictive pericarditis here. Um, from restrictive cardiomyopathy, as well as the difference between the end diastolic pressure and the left and right ventricles. As you can kind of see, it's a little bit of a scatter plot, so not the, perhaps the most useful, but uh, another thing you can add into your, uh, your thinking as you're going through this. 
Now, this is a look of a patient here with uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy, and these will be two conditions that you, you could commonly have to differentiate clinically. And I can tell you they'll show up on your on boards as well. But really, one, one of the things you see here is, so once again, this kind of restrictive mitral insula variation. Um, what you see with restrictive cardiomyopathy is actually inspiratory reversal in the hepatic veins, not expiratory reversal. So that's a key thing to keep in mind. Your mitral annular velocities with restrictive cardiomyopathy will be reduced because it's a, it's a primary myocardial process. Actually, in constriction, they'll be normal and sometimes increased uh, because the only dimension or the, the way the heart moves is longitudinally because it's restricted uh, from a circumferential manner. And then the other thing you'll see is uh, just significant left atrial enlargement, um, LVH, which are things you probably won't see as much in, uh, in a constrictive pericarditis patient with the caveat that there's overlap. And so once again, just to kind of show you this, uh, restrictive patients here, constrictive patients here. So you see the similar restrictive type physiology, the mitral inflow, there's really no respiratory variation here um, in restriction, whereas with constriction, you see this respiratory variation. Very restricted mitral uh, tissue Doppler velocities here um, in, in restriction and very exaggerated uh, in, in constriction. Those are the things to keep in mind. This is a table. I don't want to go through this, but this is a really nice paper, uh, a Jack paper by Dr. Getsky and his colleagues down at Mayo that looks at differentiating constrictive pericarditis from uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy. These are two things that can look clinically very similar, so you kind of have to rely on your uh, other, other findings to try to sort this out. Uh, and once again, this is another nice table from the same chart that kind of goes through looking initially at echocardiographic findings and then adding in cardiac CT and cardiac MRI to try to figure out where, where people fit into this uh, diagnostic pattern. And once again, there will be some overlap in certain patients. Um, some constriction patients will have myocardial disease as well. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, a final word here, and this is actually uh, looking at a COPD patient. Uh, you can see similar uh, echocardiographic findings in patients with right ventricular pericardial disease or significant lung disease. Um, the only reason I put this up mostly for the fellows, um, this was a question I was asked on my echo board. But one of the things to look at is the SVC velocity uh, with, with lung disease. There's going to be a big increase with inspiration where there's really no change with constrictive pericarditis. So that's a, a thing you can use to look at those two conditions. And so moving on to objective two, I'd like to talk a little bit about left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Sorry about that. So the first case I have for you, uh, this is a 39-year-old male. It was referred to cardiology for an abnormal ECG that showed basically left ventricular hypertrophy. And he went on an echocardiogram. So uh, things you'll see here, this is the parasternal long axis view. Uh, the first thing here, so this is the left ventricle, mitral valve, aortic valve, aorta hiding here, left atrium here, right ventricle here. The thing you, that'll catch your mind, uh, catch your eye here is the, the significant hypertrophy here within the septum. And I also want you to keep your eye here on the mitral valve. Um, and looking down here, the thing that you're seeing is part of the mitral apparatus actually in systole moving over towards the septum. Um, and this is your left ventricular outflow tract uh, region there. So this would be something that would make you suspicious for uh, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. Uh, this is a color Doppler look at this. One, once again, the big thing to show you here is there's a significant amount of turbulence in the LVOT. When you see this type of turbulence on, on an echocardiogram, you should think there's some type of process causing an increased velocity there. The other thing to keep your eye on here is this jet of blue, uh, predominantly posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation. Uh, this is an apical four-chamber view, so here's the mitral valve again, kind of once again showing this systolic anterior motion here. This isn't as nice of a picture of it. Um, and then looking down here, this is basically a, a Doppler profile through the LVOT and the aortic valve. That would look fairly similar. But the key thing to keep in mind here is this dagger-shaped appearance. Normally, you'd see a very rounded uh, symmetric type envelope. And most of the early part of systole should be filled in here. So what you're seeing is this dagger, late systolic peaking uh, gradient uh, morphology here. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. The peak gradient they measured was 56 with valve salva here on this gentleman. And this is uh, another look. I just mostly brought this up from, from the standpoint of M mode. Uh, but looking at here in systole, what you're seeing, this is the septum here in a patient with massive uh, septal hypertrophy. 
But what you see is the mitral valve here um, in, in fiscally coming in contact with the septum. So that's really what SAM would look like. And here's kind of a view, that something similar to what we saw where you see the mitral valve in systole basically making contact with the septum. So the echo, uh, the septum measured out at 2.45 uh, 2 centimeters. There was SAM posteriorly directed MR, and uh, these findings were suggestive of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Um, this was a patient I'd actually only seen a, a few times, and he bounced back and forth between multiple systems. So a lot of his more recent care was not um, here, it was uh, in other hospitals. But he had a cardiac MRI performed at an outside hospital, and I don't have these images for you. But his septum here measured uh, 2.1 centimeters, and he did have some delayed enhancement within his infralateral wall, uh, intraventricular septum. He had a loop recorder planted for some, uh, for some vasovagal type syncope, um, but given his history, they wanted to make sure he wasn't having any arrhythmias. That's been pretty unremarkable. Um, he eventually had progressive symptoms despite being uh, maintained on beta blocker and calcium channel blocker therapy. He had, you know, repeat stress echocardiogram done that showed his peak gradient went up to 77 uh, millimeters of mercury, and he was eventually referred uh, down to Mayo for a myectomy. And uh, I have images uh, post myectomy here uh, to take a look at. So once again, what you don't see here anymore is there's no systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. Looking here, really no turbulent flow in the, the left ventricular outflow tract, and really no mitral regurgitation, maybe a, a hint of it there. Uh, this is a four-chamber view here, once again, showing you that th there is really no systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. Um, this is a Doppler profile through his LVOT, left ventricular outflow tract. And I notice how different it looks than the one that I showed you initially, where that was more of a dagger shape. This is kind of more of a rounded symmetrical type appearance. So by all, by all measures, um, and, and he was clinically doing much better after his myectomy as well. Um, so his septum measured at 1.8, and like we talked about, really no evidence of SAM, MR, um, or LVOT obstruction. So to talk just a little bit about this, when you look at LVOT obstruction, by definition, it can be really valvular, which is, you know, aortic stenosis, supravalvular, uh, which is often seen in, you know, congenital heart disease, or subvalvular. And really what I'm just going to focus on is the subvalvular related to left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. You can see in congenital heart disease, you know, things like subaortic membranes, muscular narrowing, that's not really what I'm going to focus on. But those things can look, you know, very similar um, clinically. So things to go through. Um, the fixed obstructions like we talked about, you can have valve stenosis, the subaortic membranes. Um, and there's also dynamic obstructions, and that's commonly something seen in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And what we mean by dynamic is it's a loading condition dependent obstruction. So it may not be there at rest. Somebody is exercising, they get sick, something happens, they get certain medications, um, then you can have a dynamic component of it. And um, there's other examples of, of where you'll see this, and we'll go through a, a couple of them. And the biggest thing to keep in mind is you can have an underlying, you can have a component of both. You can have underlying fixed obstruction that has a dynamic component to it as well. So when to think about this? So um, I'll present a, a trauma case to you here in a second to, to go through that kind of highlights this. But uh, this really requires, in the absence of an echocardiogram, clinically you have to have a good index of suspicion for this. So this is going to be somebody that's uh, going to be hypotensive, getting more pressures, maybe getting inotropes and not really getting better. So this is some, that's a, a clinical scenario where you should think about this. Of course, if you have a nice echo like the first one I showed you, that also helps. Um, and like we talked about, the obstruction is dynamic. So classic thinking, uh, things that make the, uh, the obstruction worse would be people that are volume depleted, so that where the ventricle is in an emptier state, uh, increased contractile state, having somebody valsalva, for example, which empties the ventricle, um, after load reduction, vasodilatation, um, and hyperdynamic function. And then the last thing, which I'll come back to, is conditions that distort the uh, geometry of the left ventricle. And the way to manage this really is ensuring that patients are euvolemic. Um, that's a, the big part of it. All inotropic agents, um, dobutamine, for example, will make this worse. So you want to stop giving any type of a beta agonist and try to switch to a pure vasopressor, such as phenylephrine, vasopressin, if you need it. And then a final word I'll tell you, uh, at least just on this slide here, is that the MR, if it's secondary to, to systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, will cause posteriorly directed MR. And if you treat the LVOT obstruction, most, most patients should have a decrease in their mitral regurgitation. 
if you have central or anteriorly directed MR, there's likely another mechanism there, um, and that would be an area where a TE would be potentially helpful. And this just kind of shows you here, so with systole, what happens is the anterior uh, mitral leaflet gets pulled or sucked in towards the septum, um, and that leaves this gap here leading to the mitral regurgitation. You see that's directed posteriorly here. This is a table from, I think I actually got this from one of my USMLE exams, so it, it'll show up again probably on cardiology boards, but this looks at um, uh, maneuvers and other things to, which, that you can do to patients and looking at what happens to the murmur. The big things here are an emptier ventricle will lead to a louder murmur, which really means that there's a higher gradient there. Um, any type of beta blocker should decrease your gradient. Any type of beta agonist will, will make the obstruction worse. So these are uh, hemodynamic tracings. We have aortic stenosis on the left and the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy here on the right. The key thing to keep in mind here with aortic stenosis, we kind of have this delayed late peaking upstroke in the, uh, the aortic waveform. This is the kind of spike and dome feature that you'll see here uh, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or left, any type of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. These are just a, a couple of looks here at the Doppler profiles. Once again, this is the thing that you're kind of looking for, is this dagger-shaped, late-peaking uh, <clears throat> envelope here. And you can you know, contrast that with this more early-peaking kind of symmetric uh, aortic stenosis jet or mitral regurgitation here as well. So that's just an important thing when you're looking at the tracing. Another thing uh, here is this is, it can be particularly useful if you have somebody in the ICU that has a swan in place. Um, one of the phenomenon after a uh, PVC when patients that, that have obstruction is actually an increased obstruction. So with PVC, you have increased filling of the ventricle, um, which, you, which would theoretically decrease the degree of obstruction. But the other thing you have is an increased contractility that basically offsets that. So what you'll see after, there's your PVCs, and what you'll see after PVC is a decrease here in your aortic pressure increase in the left ventricular pressure and increased obstruction, which would be this gradient basically here. And then once again, this is uh, kind of another board type question, but looking post PVC here, looking at the difference in aortic stenosis, where really um, your aortic pressure, LV pressures don't change much, uh, comparing it to obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where there's a decrease in the aortic pressure and increase in the gradient here. So this is actually an interesting case, um, a trauma patient that I picked up from service at Hennepin. And this was a 72-year-old lady, unfortunately, was walking uh, across the street and was hit by a car. And uh, it was a hit and run accident. And she had multiple injuries, long bone, pelvic fractures, foil chest, um, really was in, uh, in a world of hurt. She was in profound shock, was on multiple vasopressors. And uh, we were actually consulted, basically given the shock and abnormal echo findings here. So um, go back to that. Sorry about that. So one of the things I'll, I'll bring your attention to here um, in this parasternal long axis. So as you can see here, the RV is just completely blown here. It's very hypokinetic and enlarged. The left ventricle is hyperdynamic. Essentially, uh, there's really no cavity here at end diastole. And the thing I want to focus your eye on here is once again the mitral valve. I'm looking and seeing that there is a suggestion here that there is some systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve coming in contact with the septum. Um, a nice look here at color Doppler. Once again, uh, increased uh, turbulent flow here in the left ventricular outflow tract and posteriorly directed MR as well. Um, I tried to pull this MO. This isn't exactly the, the cleanest looking MO, but what you're seeing here is the mitral valve here um, coming in contact with the septum in, in uh, mid to late systole. So the initial impression was that basically that she had severe RV failure, um, hyperdynamic LV function, and like we talked about, the mention of LVOT obstruction. She had, she had some you know, pretty decent images, but we, they wanted to make sure, given the degree of trauma, that there wasn't actually some other type of process uh, involving the mitral valve that was causing the degree of MR. So she underwent uh, a TEE, and basically, once again, with this first uh, picture shows you here is a lot of turbulent flow. So here's the LV outflow tract, aortic valve here. Um, this is the mitral valve, left atrium, and the left ventricle. Um, and what you're seeing here, like I said, is this turbulent flow. And then the other thing you see here is a lot of MR um, basically filling the left ventricle here. This was a nice look here, uh, basically demonstrating the mitral valve. And once again, what you see here is the mitral valve um, 
there were some other images that uh, the patient unfortunately became unstable during the study, so we had to get some get get the information we could and, and get out. Um, but what you're seeing here is the mitral valve here coming in contact with the septum, consistent with systolic anterior motion. And then another look here, once again, all the turbulent color flow, a lot of MR here um, going into the left atrium. So this kind of basically confirmed some of the things we were talking about. Um, she unfortunately uh, did not did not do well and died from uh, basically uh, multi-organ failure and, and bleeding. But uh, the, the point of that case is that not all LVOT obstruction is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There's other conditions. And I knew Dr. Sharkey was going to be here, so I had to throw some stress cardiomyopathy papers in for him. Um, but this first study is a look at uh, 32 patients, basically, uh, that, were, that were found to have uh, stress cardiomyopathy. And um, what they looked at was predictors of LVOT obstruction. And the things they found were that uh, older age was a predictor uh, of LVOT obstruction, as well as the, the septal bulging, which is something we commonly see in our older patients where the, the basal septum is hypertrophied and it actually knuckles out uh, into the, the ventricle and the LVOT. Uh, this was another paper actually looking at the percentage of patients that had LVOT obstruction in Takatsubo and septal bulging was 100% prevalent in those patients that did have LVOT obstruction versus 29% in, in those that were not. So this would be a potentially a person um, that you would want to consider for having uh, being higher risk for LVOT obstruction in the setting of stress cardiomyopathy. Uh, this is a nice uh, slide that kind of summarizes all this. So as you can see here, the, the basal segments of the ventricle are coming in, whereas the apex here is ballooned out. Um, you can see that nicely here turbulent flow in the LVOT, uh, mitral regurgitation, and then once again, this kind of dagger peaking, uh, dagger-shaped appearance uh, to the LVOT Doppler. So I'll move on to my final objective here. Um, this is talking about when to order a stress echocardiogram and how to risk stratify patients non-invasively. So this is, a, this is a very obnoxious slide, but I, I put this up here for a very good reason. So one of the things that I, tends to, um, bother me is when I hear people that get a stress test done and, and they say, well, the stress test is positive, so we have to treat all of these people the same way. And the important thing that I'm going to try to stress to you here is that stress testing is not only positive or negative, but it can give you a wealth of information into, well, how positive is it and what does this actually mean for our patients? So when we go through just a couple of words just on ordering a stress test, um, I know a lot of the cardiologists in, in the room have probably done this a few times, but uh, the things you always have to think about two two things. So uh, CT is an exception to this, but the the things to think about are so how are you going to stress the patient, traditionally exercise or with medications, and then how are you going to image them. So when we look at stressing people, exercise, dobutamine, vasodilators are common things we see in practice. Um, options for for basically imaging or, or looking for ischemia would be you know an ECG, an echocardiogram, SPECT, PET. Those are the common things that we see. And I'm not going to go through this. This is actually uh, from Dr. Schroff over at Hennepin. I really like this. Uh, it's, a, it's a three slide, basically trying to decide which stress test is most ideal for a patient. So basically the nuts and bolts of it are, you know, if patients can exercise and they have exertional symptoms, you should try to have them exercise to try to reproduce those symptoms. Um, if they can't exercise, then that kind of comes off the, uh, the table and you have to go to a pharmacologic stress test. Um, and of course, CTs uh, can really be considered across the spectrum here. So this kind of is just a flow chart. Like I said, the, I'm not going to go through this, but um, just to go through that, there's probably are multiple options for patients, but just to think that every time you order a stress test, what are you actually asking? What type of information are you looking for? So the first case I'm going to present to you uh, is a 58-year-old female, no past medical history other than some asthma and hypothyroidism really no risk factors for uh, coronary artery disease. And she would notice that when she was walking her dog, she would get a little bit of discomfort or fullness in her throat. And this had been going on for about a week and were completely new for her. So she decided to come to the hospital. Um, her labs, uh, LDL of 106, HDL of 47, A1C was unremarkable, no smoking, uh, no family history of, of coronary disease. Um, this is a, a resting ECG here, basically. So the patient here is in a sinus rhythm. Uh, really maybe a little bit of ST depression that's catching your eye um, here, but really overall, um, you know, no, no big, big ischemic changes here. She basically was admitted to the hospital given that she was having these uh, kind of escalating symptoms. 
they ruled her out, and then given the concern for these symptoms, she, we decided to order a stress echocardiogram. So to go through this here, um, at the top, this is a parasternal long axis view. What you're seeing here is the, the uh, antral septum here in the infralateral wall of the LV. This is the LV, and this is the stress image. So uh, first thing to draw your, your attention to here is so with stress, there's a, a significant decrease in the left ventricular ejection fraction. Um, the LV actually is bigger in size here than it is here. And really the entire septum um, basically just becomes uh, hypo, essentially almost akinetic. Um, and then you also see a little bit of hypokinesis here um, in the infralateral wall, not quite as pronounced. Short axis view here uh, at the papillary muscle level, normal EF, normal wall motion at rest. Once again here, the entire septum basically falls apart. The inferior wall looks okay. Anterior wall is kind of hard to comment on here because of the shadowing. Moving on to the next slide here. So this is going to be an apical floor chamber. Once again, looking at the infra septum, lateral wall, normal function at rest. Uh, with stress, essentially you see this whole area fall apart and as well as the, the uh, antral lateral wall becoming hypokinetic. Two chamber view, big thing to see here is the entire anterior wall becomes hypokinetic, yeah, essentially akinetic here. So uh, she exercised actually got up to 93% of her peak. She had a reproduction of her symptoms when she was on the treadmill, 10.6 um, mets of total exertion. Basically, her, like we talked about, extensive wall motion abnormalities. Really, the only thing that was uh, spared was the basal and mid-inferior wall, um, and her EF dropped. Given the high-risk finding, she was taken for a coronary angiogram the same day. So coronary angiogram pictures here. So this is a left catheter in the left main. This is your circumflex uh, OM system here. Um, left anterior descending artery uh, in an RAO caudal view. Here you're seeing an RAO cranial view here. And as you can clearly appreciate, there's a severe 95 plus percent stenosis in the proximal LAD uh, with really Timmy 2 flow to the distal vessel, which fills uh, much more slowly compared to the other vessels. Uh, this is a look at an LAO caudal view here. Not as nice of a look at it here, but you see the lesion um, in the proximal LAD. And then this is a, a look at her RCA, which is a, a pretty unremarkable. So she was treated uh, with primary PCI here and uh, had a very nice angiographic result, was, was sent home, um, seen in clinic, back to walking her dog. Uh, her dog seems to like that, and, and she's not having any symptoms and is doing quite well. So this is another uh, slide here, um, excuse me, going through a 63-year-old. Uh, this, do I really want to use this case? Well, I guess I decided to use this case. So uh, a 63-year-old male with uh, coronary artery disease had prior PCI uh, to an OM1 in 2010, uh, was a former smoker, hyperlipidemia. And he was admitted uh, in June. Well, I don't think I've ever done that before. Uh, was admitted in June 3rd. Uh, of this year with chest discomfort. This was his resting ECG, uh, basically sinus uh, rhythm here, really not much in the way of uh, any ischemic changes um, and no Q waves to suggest an old infarct here at all. Uh, once again, he was admitted, his troponin values were negative, and he also went a uh, stress echocardiogram. So similar format here to the initial, initial pictures uh, that we looked at, parasternal long axis view here. Um, the pictures here, I'll tell you, are, are not quite as clear, but really looking here at the antral septum, um, infralateral wall, things look okay here. As you come down to the short, uh, short axis view, what you kind of start to see is if you put your cursor here, um, you know, everything's kind of moving, moving in pretty nicely. There is a suggestion, if you do the same thing here, that this area um, of the lateral wall was not coming in quite as well. And moving on to the, the apical view, so once again, four chamber view, pretty normal uh, wall motion at rest here. And then you don't see it as well here, but there is a suggestion that this antral lateral wall was not coming in quite as well. And then this is a two-chamber view here. Um, once again, kind of the apical anterior wall here is a little bit hypokinetic. So this patient um, exercised uh, basically got 90% of his heart rate, um, seven meds. He did have reproduction of his symptoms and um, under, uh, proceeded to have an invasive coronary angiogram here. And so looking here, uh, first view, this is his uh, catheter here in the left main. Um, there's a stent here, which I'll show you a little bit later in the, the first OM that's patent. Uh, LAD here, for the most part, looks okay. And you see some diagonals going off to the side. Um, here's the stent. It doesn't project that well in the OM right there. Uh, and then you see the LAD system here. And really, I'll bring your attention to this shot. 
which shows us pretty nicely. So this is a pretty large uh, size first diagonal vessel uh, that has a significant lesion here in the proximal part of the, the, the wall um, of the, the artery. And this really fit nicely with the lateral and um, apical, uh, not so much maybe the apical anterior um, hypokinesis, but just going off to the lateral wall. Uh, and then a look at the right coronary artery here, which um, has some kind of mild disease, but nothing significant. So he was treated with primary PCI of his diagonal, um, discharged on intensified medical therapy, and ended up going home and, and once again is doing well. So a couple of things just to talk about, um, you know, some of the benefits of, of stress echocardiography, when to use this. Uh, you, you get a look at the, basically the, the entire heart. So you can visualize LV, RV function, um, wall motion abnormality. And, you know, you can use it for ischemia and coronary disease, but there's also other cases as well. Um, you can look for dynamic ischemic MR. Uh, I have a case actually from a patient, uh, a collaboration between Hennepin and here, a guy that had come to the hospital, I think six or seven times um, last year with flash pulmonary edema. They ended up uh, doing an angiogram on him. He had an OM, uh, a CTO of a large OM1 lesion and uh, basically was stressed again and found to have significant ischemic MR, um, ischemia in the territory of that OM lesion significant MR, and actually that, we, we actually almost put him into pulmonary edema on the treadmill. So he was sent over here, uh, Dr. Burke, did a, a CTO PCI on him that was successful, and he actually hasn't been to the hospital in the last uh, year plus. So that was a, a really nice example where to, where to use this to look for dynamic ischemic MR. You can look at uh, gradients such as uh, left ventricular output tract obstruction. And then the last thing, this kind of comes out of the valve guidelines, is when you have basically valve disease and symptom severity that are discordant. So somebody that has severe valve findings by echo and says they don't have symptoms or somebody that has moderate valve disease and, and has significant symptoms, another role would be to try to see if you could correlate um, the symptoms with the, the, the disease, uh, the degree of valve disease. The benefit, there's no radiation. Um, one of the downsides, of course, is that, you know, this is very imaging dependent, um, especially in some of our bigger patients, patients with uh, bad lung disease. If you can't see the heart, it's kind of hard to rule out ischemia. And the other part of this is, um, you know, it, it kind of requires a, a well-trained lab, well-trained sonographers to be able to rapidly acquire images. So those are some of the downsides of this. Um, this is a nice uh, table out of the, I can't remember what year these, uh, these were the non-invasive guidelines, but looking at um, basically risk stratifying your patients. And if there's something that you can remember from this objective, um, I think it's, it's really this. So looking at what classifies or what makes your patients high risk, intermediate risk and, and low risk. So if you look at this, for example, a small myocard myocardial perfusion defect, less than 5% of the myocardium or over 10% of the myocardium at rest, those are all positive stress tests, right? But they mean very different things. So that's an important thing um, I just want all of you to think about is that not only are you getting information potentially about ischemia, but also you can really look at, well, how high risk is this patient to have a cardiac event or even die in the future? So. Um, I have just some studies looking at quantification of ischemia uh, and outcomes that we'll finish with. So uh, this is a study that looked at uh, wall motion score index, and um, this is something that we do basically scoring a wall as normal, one, um, hypokinetic, two, uh, akinetic, three, or dyskinetic, four, and basically summing up the entire heart. One is a normal score where every segment is normal, and a higher score is bad. So as you can see, as the wall motion score index goes up, the cardiac event rate uh, significantly goes up. And then this is another thing really that has implications for management. Um, looking at here in the, the kind of brown bars, these are patients that underwent revascularization, and these were patients that uh, in blue that did not. And as you can see, the, the patients with the highest burden of ischemia um, really did, did better with intervention. So, uh, you know, potentially having somebody in a lower risk, positive stress zone where they could be medically managed, this tells you people that have a high burden of ischemia really should be revascularized. Um, this was basically looking at uh, stress echocardiogram and wall motion score index and stratifying patients, and they actually found here in this case um, that they were able to stratify patients into whether they would be revascularized and have cardiac events just based on their uh, wall motion score index. Um, this was a post-MI study. This actually looked at both LVEF and wall motion score index and basically being able to predict um, outcome, and both were a predictor and additive to each other in terms of predicting death in, in cardiovascular events. Interestingly, wall motion score index actually was also an independent predictor for heart failure hospitalization, so uh, maybe another side effect, uh, or a side bonus here. This is looking at dobutamine stress echocardiography in women. 
as you can see here, uh, event-free survival, normal studies up here, and then looking at a resting ab uh, abnormality and ischemia, and the worst prognosis if you have resting abnormalities and ischemia. And really to say, this just say, it says you have more coronary disease than these people up here. Um, this is a study, this is a spec study looking at uh, basically cardiac death here in black, and then looking at uh, MI in white as a function of how abnormal a test was. The more abnormal your stress tests are, the higher the event rate. You see the same thing here with survival and uh, event-free survival, basically. The people that have the highest risk test do the worst. Um, this is a study looking at uh, spec defect size in renal patients. Once again, no defect, moderate defect to large. The, the survival significantly starts to drop. And they actually also looked at this in terms of you know, coronary artery disease and, and how much uh, coronary disease patients had. So really, I think these two things say very similar things. The, the more abnormal your stress test is, the more coronary disease you have, and the worse you do. This is a study looking at uh, rubidium 82 PET. Um, basically, cumulative survival, the higher the uh, ischemia here, based greater than 20 percent, um, zero percent, and then in between, the more ischemia, the worse you do. Uh, this is a study here looking at SPEC, once again, just breaking it into uh, abnormal and event rates, normal here, and then looking at whether it's normal, the degree of reversibility, whether it's mild or moderate, fixed, partially reversible, and the, the more the ischemia, the worse you do. That's really the, the big point here. Uh, and because Dr. Lester is here, I had to put a couple of things in about uh, cardiac CT. So this is looking at basically uh, the degree of coronary disease found on a cardiac CT in event free survival. So essentially what you see is no coronary disease at the bottom. Um, these colors don't project quite as well. But as you start to go from one to the three vessel disease, your outcomes worsen. Um, this is looking at that same study, looking at it by age, less than 55, uh, 55 to 65 and over 65, and, and, and that holds regardless of, of one's age. Um, this is kind of a, a busier slide here, but a graph here, but once again, looking at uh, outcome by coronary artery calcium score, patients here at, uh, at the top with zero and then going all the way down, basically the more coronary artery calcium they have, the more vessels that are diseased, the worse your overall outcome. So the, the final point there is really don't think of, you know, your stress test as just being positive or negative. Um, think about what they mean for your patients. The patients with the higher risk stress tests are the ones that really you, you want to revascularize. Patients with lower risk stress tests, depending on their symptoms, can maybe be managed medically. So those are just some things to think about. Um, and these are, these are my references. Dr. Sharma, that was a great, great talk. If the late Dr. Daniel was here, he would always say that these are always his favorite grand rounds when we hear case presentations, and you really covered a lot of ground today. I'd like to just cover the first case a little bit. You know, constriction is the, certainly um, the cardiologist's most challenging case, or certainly in that group of challenging cases. And in this particular case, I was just going to point out a few things that are interesting about the whole presentation and some of the findings. In terms of the history with constriction, I don't think there really is such a thing as acute constriction or maybe even subacute constriction. One of the great challenges of the diagnosis is the history of chronicity. Uh, sometimes we'll say that's because the three previous cardiologists failed to recognize the diagnosis. But the reality is, is that it probably is a smoldering disease that occurs over time. And if you think of the anatomy of what you're left with, that would make sense. Uh, in this particular case, I didn't get necessarily the sense that he had that level of chronicity and also from an exam perspective, many times you'll see these patients have bloated abdomen, significant ongoing recurring peripheral edema, uh, and all of those features kind of lead you toward constriction. Cachexia seems to be something that goes with that with the liver distension, et cetera. The second point from an echocardiographic perspective, um, very challenging again. Uh, two things to point out. Um, yes, it had all the hemodynamic features that you um, so uh, well pointed out to us, but two things to keep in mind. One is that uh, you mentioned it briefly, but right ventricular dysfunction is a great masquerader of constriction, and this patient had right ventricular dysfunction, which makes me question, I wonder whether or not this patient had chronic recurring PEs, and that's why there was a presence of right ventricular dysfunction. The second thing is, is that it would be very unusual to have a large pericardial effusion. 
in the setting of, as you pointed out, the word encasement of the left and right ventricle. Um, and so, at least in series I've looked at and participated in, that would be an unusual feature echocardiographically. Now, for all of those reasons, I'm a huge proponent of multimodality imaging in patients who have constriction, and so I love CT and MR and everything I can get, and it's one of those diagnoses where I'll order every test to help me confirm what they really have, and so I'd be a big advocate of that. And I guess at the end of the day, I'd have to say that I agree with the autopsy. I think this patient had fibrinous pericarditis, but probably not constriction. Nice uh, summary of uh, uh, stress testing at the end here, Amit. And I'd like to thank you for bringing up stress echo, which I, I'm a big utilizer of CT. But I think we always forget about stress echo, and I, I think it's been a long time since we talked about it here. But for all the reasons that you mentioned, absence of any radiation to the patient, the ability to look at the valves, the pulmonary pressures, et cetera, the exercise performance, I, I think uh, I, I think it's nice to uh, to have this in, in our uh, use of use of tests. Well, like, like David, I'm in, fascinated by the constriction case, and I think I remember you saying that the uh, intracardiac hemodynamics did not support constriction. Is that uh... well? So the the hemodynamics basically had near equalization of the, the end diastolic pressures across the chambers. The one thing that they didn't see was the the clear ventricular interdependence between the LV and the LV mm -hmm. tracers. Okay. Other questions? Um, good job. I think one of the things sometimes we notice is that although we don't see it clinically or this manifestation clinic, is that if they come in with acute pericarditis, for example, frequently they actually have signs of constriction. Um, although they don't manifest, but some do manifest clinically. And of those that have acute inflammation, those are the ones that actually will reverse with therapy. But if they come in with constriction and using MR or CT, there's no uptake of either gadolinium or contrast later on, these are the patients often where surgery is needed. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Thank you, everybody. And on the way out, please see our sponsors. We've got Brian and Lisa from BMS and Laura from Pfizer. <laughs>